The first musical experience I remember was five years old. There was a lot of chaos going on. We were left with babysitters for long periods of time. We had this old lady who lived in Fullerton, and she had a spare bedroom with a hi-fi and all this religious kind of renaissance nudity and pictures on the wall and i just just go in there and just like turn on the radio and look at the pictures and sex drugs and rock and roll are right here and i knew at that age that that's what i was going to do I had posters in my wall in my room, and it was Bruce Lee, Keith Richards, and John Dillinger. And I wanted to be like all of those guys. The minute I saw Easy Rider, it was like, I'm not going to try out for Pop Warner or Little League. I'm going to build a chopper bike and ride it around and, and be cool. My father played guitar around the house, but he was into country music, and that's where I got that background from. I would fall asleep to him playing Wildwood Flower, you know, in the room, and I'm going to sleep, and or uh, some old country standard, and that was my first exposure to it, and it provided a, a safe haven, and music did something magical for me. It makes me feel so good that I, I need to learn how to do this. This would have been 1967, so you got to realize what was being played on the radio back then. Probably top 40, but top 40 still sucked. But, you know, every now and then the good artists would get in, you could hear some Sam and Dave, you hear some Aretha Franklin, um, some Creedence Clearwater. You know, I remember uh, one day putting a, the Beatles, 45, at my grandmother's house, day tripper, and she lived in an old nice house in Lakewood with a raised foundation, wood floors, big old six foot hi-fi magna box, and I put on day tripper, and that guitar just sounded so big, and you hear it now, it's all doing, 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 but back then, to a little kid, it was bigger, it was larger than life, and you know, I look out the front door and my uncles are out there with their low riders and their choppers and their girlfriends. And that's the life that I wanted. And I wanted to be a part of that. Most people don't realize this, but my musical background is all in 60s and 70s rock and roll. Chuck Berry, Mick Taylor, Mick Ronson, Bad Company. You know, the 70s was guitar rock. Then I got into the glitter music, which was T-Rex and, and Bowie. They were kind of cosmic, and that worked at the time. I subconsciously always had a desire for a little bit more guitar, but I was also evolving. I was angry. I was pissed off. I needed some music that was going to help me express that. I remember third grade, my friend's older brother playing a Black Sabbath record for us. And it was just like, what's happening right now, dude? It's like, we're like watching a horror movie and but it's like rock and roll too and it was like shaping my direction it was a natural progression when i heard punk you know when i heard the 
the Pistols album, it was like, this is everything. It's so stripped down. The guitars are loud. God Save the Queen. I mean, that record sounded like how I felt inside. It was kind of like what I had been waiting for. You're 18, want to be a man. Your granddaddy's in the Ku Klux Klan. Take your two steps forward and four steps back. Go to the White House and back. With music, I'm always trying to find something that either is close to how I'm feeling inside already or evokes a feeling when I put it on and then I get inspired from that. It was the same feeling as when I bought my first stereo. I bought a Marantz 2215 and, you know, the, turning off all the lights and then turning that stereo on at night and it would just light the whole room up green and it's part of the experience. And it was a world of fantasy. Like, I knew how to move before I knew how to play. I think I was like 15, got a job canvassing, you know, uh, for air conditioning and heating. And I saved up and went to the Fullerton pawn shop and bought a 1971 mahogany uh, Gibson SG. It was my first professional guitar. And shortly after I got that guitar, my uncle bought me my first real amp, and it was a silver-faced Fender Bassman uh, on a 212 combo. Those things have to be on 10 to, to sound good. And I lived across the street from this park and I'm trying to learn smoke on the water and I'm in the garage. I got it on 10. Well, the park would carry the sound like almost two miles and I'm playing the song wrong. So the cops came. They said something like either turn it down or learn to play it right. The only lessons I ever took were introduction to classical guitar. I learned to play Michael Rose, The Boat Ashore, um, Blowing in the Wind, and some other standard. And three years later, I wrote 1945. I wanted to emulate my heroes, Credence Clearwater, Rolling Stones, The Pistols, and eventually, the Ramones. <laughs> For me, it was how I expressed my voice. I mean, I didn't really fit in with other kids. I really had to fight to find my voice. The guitar really helped me do that. I was writing about rebelling against mom and dad and the cops back then and I always had a sound that had an attitude to it. It's kind of just like a stiff jab. You've got the squeeze and you've got the attack, then you've got the physical guitar and the emotion behind the song. A lot of that's also how you play. You can plug into a Marshall, and, but if you're not attacking it, it's gonna just sound so-so. At the same time I was finding that tone, I was also discovering that if the song doesn't groove, you're just bashing through chords. I became very groove orientated and that also goes back to the music of the 60s and 70s, to Motown or to Credence Clearwater Stones. It's all groove. Your attack is kind of based on that, um, whether it's a backbeat or a downbeat or sustain. But even when I'm doing a song like Bakersfield, it's got power. I always say that the Ramones and the Rolling Stones are really social distortion because those are the two bands that shaped me. I learned about the blues via the Stones. I didn't know about Muddy Waters and Elmore James and all of that as a 10-year-old kid. And then the Ramones, this buzzsaw guitars. I mean, no one plays guitar like Johnny Ramone. I absorbed sonically this era of music, it's tube amp, it's analog, it's blues-based, 
rock and roll with melodies. I can't seem to make it Make it all my own I'd say the five songs that would make the top five for guitar for me as far as influence would be Gimme Shelter. I saw the Stones in 1975. I was a kid, I was young, and there was this huge just counterculture thing going on and hanging out in head shops. And the Stones were just the shit. They were bigger than life. I would have to say Ziggy Stardust, the song Ziggy Stardust, you know, just that tone. Third would be the song Bad Company by Bad Company. There's something about the production of that record uh, done in a mobile truck and in some mansion in England. It's pretty bitchin', yeah. Commando by the Ramones. Just in your face. God Save the Queen. I thought I was Sid Vicious when I was 17 and playing with a knife and I almost cut off this finger you know, and so it's handicapped. People are just like looking like, why, why is he playing like that? And it's because his finger is almost useless. For instance, I do an A minor like this. Most people do it like this, but this hand is limited. Hence my blues scales are not as good as they could be. So if you're 17 years old playing with a knife, think twice. I have friends who just leave me in the dirt with their guitar playing and my, my talent has always been more to songwriting. Um, however, I, I do um, try to, well I don't, I'm really lazy. You know, I, I don't like to practice scales and I don't do any of that shit. Really, I was just trying to emulate what had, what had made me so happy in years prior. All those styles of music played an integral part in shaping me. punk scene and the, and the underground music scene was thriving by the time I was 17 and I was really lucky to uh, catch that wave, you know, with those older guys because they, they really did change my life. They were all in garage bands and, and it was all about just going to the, the rehearsals and uh, a particular band uh, that stands out was a band called The Mechanics. And downtown Fullerton, they were uh, just, I mean, they dressed in gas station attendant clothes, dirty. They drank beer out of quart oil cans. And they, they came out and said, hey, we're the mechanics and we don't play any fucking slow songs. They were a huge influence on my guitar playing and style and, and just, you know, attitude. The venues back at that time were very small and very spread out. We had, you know, uh, Ichabod's, which was in Fullerton, which near the college, which was kind of like, you know, they had like new wave night, you know, and then you could go and see some bands that would be like acceptable, you know, like they wouldn't let anyone, they wouldn't let the germs or anyone play there, but they'd let like the plugs or or someone like that play. But it was my watering hole and, and the cuckoo's nest 
was the opposite of that. They'll let anybody play. And then we would go to Redondo Beach. We would go to Hollywood. We went just wherever because it was very spread out. Those were some of the first places that we got to play. And we got to play because some of the older kids I mentioned and some of the older bands like Eddie and the Subtitles or the Adolescents had us open for them. Obviously, there was not computers and, you know, so you just heard of word of mouth or you were on the bus and saw some kid with a cropped haircut and asked him, hey, what's, where are the parties tonight? What bands are playing anywhere? Or flyers, flyers at the local record store. My whole junior and senior year of high school, I would go to the Starwood in Hollywood on a Tuesday night and make it back to school. You know, the next day, sometimes after being up all night. Before the P90 and the Les Paul, you played whatever you could afford. You know, back then, you know, a Gibson Melody Maker was cheap, or Dennis, my guitar player, who, the guy who started the band with me, he used to get TV model Les Paul Juniors, you know, for like $300. Him and I were always kind of experimenting, but it was basically what whatever you could afford at the time. We were a young punk band who was weren't we weren't making any kind of money. We didn't have jobs, so um, we just got what we could. And all these guys in Fullerton who were like the older guys. Who I was hanging out with, you know, always talked about Fender Basements, and most people don't know it. It's a it's a bass amp originally, and somewhere along the line, someone figured out and made a better guitar amp. In the mid '80s, uh, when I was also listening to a lot of American Roots music and trying to define the sound of social distortion, I wanted to get a guitar tone that was going to also separate us from everybody else. And just like what I was trying to achieve with the songwriting, what I was trying to establish with our image and our style, something that was gonna stand apart from everybody else. I can't relate to doing what everybody else is doing. So the Fender Bassman really uh, helped me uh, define our sound. I would describe that sound as very urgent, very emotional, and can be dark or can be light. It's versatile, but it's definitely full of attitude and angst. And I'm It was 1984, I had to get out of Fullerton. That was the peak of my drug addiction. And the writing was kind of non-existent during the, the junkie years, you know? I mean, uh, all the stuff was in the pawn shop. I was either in the county jail or in some rehab or, or MIA. From 83 to 85, that two year period was just dark. I wasn't doing much writing at that time. Yeah. I almost lost touch with music. I almost lost touch with life. I mean, I, I was overdosing and, and getting in really just dangerous situations out on the streets and very lucky to have survived that and not had to go to prison or, or not died and been a little paragraph in a little punk fanzine. Very lucky, yeah. I was wanted for a bunch of petty crimes and burglaries and stuff and finally got caught and uh, it was just best that I left Fullerton and try and get cleaned up and, and, and that's really when the band started for me because the first five years really were just a party and uh, 
I mean, we were able to grab a little momentum, but at the end of 1984, people were walking out of shows because I was so fucked up or, you know, or, you know, we obviously weren't rehearsing and, you know, taking it serious. So, uh, so in 1985, after I got clean, I moved to Costa Mesa and music was the only good thing I had going for me. And I realized that if I wanted to continue doing it, I was going to have to look at it like a job and get serious and pay dues. You know, we traveled in a van with seven guys for, for many years across this country for six, 12 weeks at a time. And, uh, came home with, you know, a few hundred dollars, you know, if that. But when I got clean, it was astonishing the focus that I had. And also, now you're feeling. I had medicated myself since I was 12 years old and not felt feelings. And now, uh, feeling feelings for the first time, it allowed me to articulate myself more in my writing, I think more accurately. Well, the, the songwriting process hasn't changed a whole lot. I mean, it begins with me alone with an acoustic guitar. For years, I just, I still have it somewhere, a ghetto box where I just record on cassette and I get the melodies and, and kind of the structure, a chorus and a verse, and I get the idea down and then I bring the guys down to rehearsal and, and we start to play it. We establish the groove, you know, usually with me and, playing guitar and the drummer, getting the kick and snare pattern to where I have him play what I think accurately I have in my head. And then the bass comes in, another guitar, and then we start to just kind of work on an arrangement. I'd say maybe one out of 10, I'll get the premise for the song right when I have the idea. The melody and the catchphrase will come, at, or the theme will come at the same time. But that only happens once in a while. Most of the time, it's just a melody. I like to finish the song, sometimes even record it in the studio before I even know what it's about. And then I have to sit with it and listen to it and see what kind of feelings it, uh, it evokes in me. And hopefully I have a list of possible titles and themes so I can kind of go look at that and go, does this... Oh, this would work with that. I'm a Gibson guy. I steered away from Les Pauls for a while because I thought they were too heavy and I wouldn't be able to get air and jump, you know. I think I borrowed one one, one night and, you know, still could get three or four feet in the air, and it's like, oh, this, ain't, this isn't so bad. And for me to set down the Les Paul is like asking Linus to set down his blanket, you know? It's like, may not happen. There's an old saying, uh, probably some old blues guy said it, that if you don't have your tone, you might as well just go home. There's so many ingredients that go into tone, I believe it begins with the wood. You buy a guitar from the 1950s. The wood was old when they made it. It had acclimated, it had aged, and when wood acclimates, it gets, um, it gets hard, but it breathes. The wood today is made to grow fast and for production. So it's not maturing, it's, it's weak. I don't feel the warmth and tone from that. It, it lacks um, body and it lacks uh, character. In the early 90s, we got asked to tour with Neil Young. And this just happened to be right when I was just like, struggling to get a guitar tone that was going to separate us from everybody else. 
first of all, I would watch Neil Young play every night. He had a monster guitar tone. Uh, like, how's he doing that? And, and then we got to know his guitar tech. And that's basically where he taught me that you take a 70s Les Paul Deluxe that comes stock with mini humbuckers. I watched him backstage pull out a mini humbucker and drop it in a trash can. <laughs> it's routed the same for a P90. And you put the P90s in, and this is like a, an Americano with cream. It's like smooth. <laughs> I have two setups. This one, uh, 76 and 77, had a maple neck. And what I like is for the capo songs, I detune half a step and capo up a hole, which makes no sense at all, except for, for me, it's a comfort thing because I have to compensate because of a handicapped hand. I've had this guitar for about... 20 years. This is a 1976 gold top Gibson Deluxe with P90s dropped in it. Uh, this is the Seymour Duncan pickup he makes for me. And Ernie Ball strings, 10 and 52. My first pack of Ernie Ball strings was probably 1982 or something. It's been a great relationship. I just want dependability and I want consistency. You want your amp to be that way. You want your guitar strings to be that way. You want everything to be dependable. It's just become another ingredient in the sound. Ernie Ball, it works good. So what I was saying is that uh, it's getting a lot of wear from sweating every night. Some nights you're playing venues that uh, say there's 2,500 people in there, that's 5,000 lungs sucking air and heat and moisture in the air. And uh, basically you walk off stage soaking wet. And what's happening is the binding is starting to get lifted, which is, a, you know, not a big deal. But I bought several others uh, in the last few years to kind of it's fun to break them in. So I give this one a rest and kind of use this to write with and record with and while I'm breaking in some others. I love how the, uh, the gold starts to patina and turn green. And, uh, you know, it's about nine pounds, which isn't light by any stretch of the imagination, but it's a decent weight for this year. And these are still affordable, which is what I like about them. No one I know is hunting these down, so I can still find them. For me, it's a combination of like the capo, the maple neck, the P90, the weight of the guitar. And then, you know, I spread, I use one Fender Bassman, which is 50 watts, but I spread it through eight speakers, two Marshall cabs, vintage cabs on each side of the drum riser. So I get a nice full sound from behind and I put a little on the side fills and then I also have in-ears. So I'm feeling it as well as just hearing it. It's probably been a year now. I heard Johnny's guitar tech. He used the analogy of like, you're playing a vintage guitar through a vintage amp, but you're going through this first. Why would you do that? Why would you compromise your sound? And it's just like, oh, he's fucking right. Wirelesses are nice because you can move around without restriction. But I got so sick of like playing festivals, headliners trying to like make sure they got all their signals and everyone's bogarting frequencies. And it's like, fuck you all, you know? I'm gonna go back to a fucking chord and 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 have better tone than all you motherfuckers.
created this space because we had outgrown our original studio in Fullerton. It was crammed with road cases and it was too hard to create there. It was a hassle to get there. It was just too small. And I just decided to put a little bit of money into this and create a space that people want to come to rehearsal. It sounds great and we can do crude pre-production here. I do all my writing up there and uh, sometimes I even spend the night here and it's pretty cool to like write at night, go to sleep, kind of wake up in the morning and saunter out to the kitchenette and make an Americano and wake up basically immersed in work. So it's kind of a weird thing that happens where just the sleep only, no other distractions. It's, I found it to be very uh, productive. I'm a, an obsessive collector of all good things. <laughs> and uh, not just guitars and amps, but cars and whatever. But that's another story. You know, I brought out some other rare amps that, in my opinion, sound equally as good, but unique in their own way. Some of them are, were made by Valco for other companies. Some of them are just, you know, you know, Harmony. Uh, that's a national. Um, this thing says an F, it should say WTF for what the fuck, because it sounds so fucking good. Yeah, so, you know, it's a float of tone. Same here, here's a Duke of tone. They're just, this was, uh, they were accordion amps. You know, some fucking polka band, you know, who knew that, you know, they would end up in Mike Ness's studio. You know, uh, these are great for recording or just coming here and uh, plug it in and just to get a little bit of inspiration. For me, the authentic sound helps kind of get, get me in the mood. Well, I look at buying old guitars very similar to the way I look at buying an old house or an old car. Um, you can't help but wonder what went on before you were there, uh, what kind of stories or what kind of history was made in this house, who drove the, this car, what did this guitar player do, what bands did he play in, what did he write, did he write, did he play for someone famous. There's something in the, the characteristics of the old wood, just like in an old house or an old car, whether it's the smell or the patina or the aging that just makes it feel uh, like an old soul. You kind of already know what to expect, but at the same time, you're kind of like curious about it and see as to what's going to happen. I mean, it's Keith Richards right there. The next record that I work on, the solo, I want it to be a little bit more Americana. So in order to do that, I'm gonna to have to let the Les Paul down a little bit and maybe play a telly for some of the rhythms and just get some different texturings. This is a guitar I bought from Johnny Two Bags when we were recording the last record. And uh, it's a 52 telly that's been stripped and I like it stripped. I probably wouldn't repaint it. Kind of like the, Springsteen look to it. And... It's nice to have these set up when you're writing. You know, some days you might pick up the Gretsch and see what happens. You know, write something that's a little bit more uh, rockabilly or um, less rhythm guitars, more texturings. I mean, this is 1955, so. There's probably some guy in a bow tie just doing candy bubble gum. But it sounds so authentic. It's nice to have, you know, an array of stuff to experiment and play around with, too. 
you know, get different feels and different inspirations. Mm -hmm. look back historically at industry in America, the homes that were built in the 1920s and 30s that are still standing in the 1950s. We still had nice cars, but you start to notice that the houses start to get a little cheaper, not as well made. Unfortunately, we live in a disposable society today and things are not made to last. That's why I play vintage guitars. That's why I collect vintage guitars. You put the right combinations together, it's like putting an engine together. It's a combination of the internal parts, the heads, the carburation, the spark, everything. It's all relative. It was nice once I found it to like, uh, okay, now I can, now I can relax. I've got that. I've got the motor running. Now just figure out where we're going. Most people wouldn't associate, you know, a tone with a car, but most of these old cars don't even have a radio in them that works. I, I don't like to listen to music when I'm driving these old cars. I listen to the motor. You know, there's nothing that sounds like an old flathead V8 motor or a straight six. When I'm driving, it's like I got my guitar tone, but I got my car tone, and I, I enjoy that uh, just as much as playing guitar sometimes. It's just self-expression. It's just like writing a song. When I build a car, it's got so many just unique details to it, one piece at a time, and a process. Sometimes you have to scour a swap meet or a couple of swap meets to find the part that you're looking for. It's everything from engine work to body work to color paint to upholstery. And it's just like writing a song, a verse, chorus, bridge. Well, these cars were built just like uh, the old homes or the old buildings or the old guitars and amps. They were built when art and industry were one. That's a 1936 Ford and it's still fucking standing. And it's a work of art. Buck Owens, Johnny Cash, and, and Keith Richards. Well, I mean, I think it would be fun to play guitars, but I think it would be almost funner to play a game of poker or something. But, you know, to play with those guys, come on, that would be insane. This is the holy grail right here. The minute you pick this up, you just want to write a ballad. The acoustic guitar became important to me during the writing of Prison Bound. It had been five years since we recorded Mommy's Little Monster in 1983. I got clean in 85, started writing Prison Bound about 1987. At the time, uh, you know, I was painting houses for a living and, and listening to oldies, you know, Chuck Berry and uh, Elmore James. And I put down drugs and alcohol and all of a sudden I had all this like energy you know, all this energy that used to go into, you know, getting drugs every day and committing petty crimes and 
uh, hustling and just doing asshole maneuvers, you know, <laughs> was like, uh, now I ha had energy and I had focus and somewhere, I guess I had a work ethic. Punk was starting to really kind of stereotype itself. And, uh, you know, a lot of bands sounded the same. When I got clean, I started buying just reissue vinyl, just blues, rockabilly, country music. I just realized that we were, you know, an American band and we needed to grasp a hold of our American roots. Blues to country music. And uh, so the acoustic guitar was a way when I was writing Prison Bound to kind of uh, separate ourselves from what everybody else was doing. And Prison Bound was the song that got radio airplay and got assigned to a major label. And it was just basically a four chord ballad. Anything to do with guitars or the stage or the tour bus or, or, I mean, that's my element. It's like some people can surf, some people can act or whatever. This just happens to be what I do and this is where I feel the most comfortable. This is the great escape. I close my eyes and you guys are gone. It's magic. I'm writing a song right now. Well, I've been, it's an old idea, probably 15 years old, that I haven't finished yet, but it's, uh, it's a song called Me and My Guitar. And, uh, it basically just talks about the relationship between the two of us, the intimacy and the, uh, the freedom that it's provided for me the voice it's given me. It's a gift that I, I don't take for granted, but it's it's really a journey that me and if you you know, it's an object, but it's a very sentimental object that's been a constant in my life when there's been a lot of non constants. So it's provided security. So it's much more than just a career. It's kind of like a, I don't want to say a family member, but it's, it's just, it's just, it's part of me. It's, it's, it's like an arm. Back to Almost there. When you're writing, you have to keep certain things in mind. Of course, you're going to write a song you want it on the radio. Even when we were playing in the underground clubs of Hollywood, I still wanted the world to hear us. I also have to think about like keeping the signature things that our fans love. It's the honesty, it's the attitude, it's the angst, it's the rebelliousness. And then the third thing, not being afraid to think out of the box a little bit. And because I wouldn't be here if I would have never taken risks. 
you know. I took a risk when I wrote that record 25 years ago. I didn't know people were going to like Ball and Chain or Story of My Life or I really didn't. I knew I did and that was really my gauge for being true to myself was that, you know what? Hey, at least I would have made a record that I liked when I do, you know, meet fans either before the show or after the show or out in public. I get feedback from people who come up to me and say, man, you know what, Mike? You know, your music got me through some hard times. When I was sitting there with the acoustic guitar, I wasn't like, I'm gonna write a song that's gonna get people through hard times. I was just probably going through hard times myself. And that's what I needed to do to get through it. So I just simply replied, you know, me too. I felt the need to do the solo stuff because here I was kind of, sometimes I felt like I was cramming country music or blues down these punk rockers' throats. That was fine, but I always felt like I could only go so far. I could never bring in a fiddle player or a pedal steel or people would say, it's just not so distortion anymore. I was worried about that kind of stuff at the time. I wanted to do a solo project that would just show people uh, other sides of me. Just started to really appreciate writing on an acoustic, you know, because it's just, uh, it's loud enough when I'm alone and they translate well to the Les Paul. And um, you can go in either direction with it. You can, you can, uh, if I want it to be hard, I just need to just, you know, change the attack a little bit. But if, if it's a ballad, uh, I can still uh, work it with an acoustic guitar. I remember after touring the solo records and going back to Social Distortion, it was fun again. It was like, okay, I went and did that, I took a risk, it was great, I, I love it, I'll continue to do that, but now, oh, this feels fun again, this feels new again. So I really did need a break, a creative break, and and it also built confidence, you know. When you take a risk and it pays off, uh, that gives you uh, belief in yourself and, and confidence to go back to what you already know. Well, I have two things now that I listen to for inspiration. One is production value. So I'm listening to Tom Petty Wildflower, you know, produced by Rick Rubin. If I played that for you right now in the stereo system, you would experience music the way it is supposed to be listened to. And I don't know any of her other music, but uh, a song Rihanna did, Stay, insane insanely powerful, insanely beautiful, and just uh, insanely emotional. What's another weird thing is, is that this is the 25th anniversary of the self-titled record, which was a poignant place of our career. I don't listen to my own music very often, so playing this set, playing this record is very interesting being in a songwriting mode right now, going back 25 years, I was younger. I was like, what was I thinking when I did this arrangement? I don't know what I did, but it's really cool. Um, I think it was an accident that I figured that out, but I want to try and do that again because it really translates live or it's, wow, that's pretty cool. Um, or just reflecting where I was at emotionally. That's been interesting, but I try to keep an open mind to my influences, but right now it's anything by Tom Petty and, uh, you know, Car Wheels on a Gravel Road by Lucinda Williams.
rock and roll is still so new. When rock and roll was starting, it was for the young. And I mean, it's only been around since the mid 40s. So it's kind of like uh, no one really knew, like, well, what do you do when you're 70? You can't jump four feet in the air anymore. For me, it's very important not to try and be something I'm not. I'm 53 years old. I'm not going to try and dress like I'm 23. I think the authenticity is best when you're just being yourself. This last year's been crazy. You know, I've been going through a lot of changes. I've been sober 30 years, but it took 28 years to consider, you know, looking at therapy to, to deal with childhood trauma. My kids are growing up, they moved out. It's just me and the wife. We're in couples therapy. It's like I want to save my marriage. There's a lot of shit going on. And that's what great records come from. At the time you're going through it, you're just like, fuck this, man. Fuck this, I hate this, you know. But I know from experience that everything worthwhile in life is worth fighting for and doesn't come easy sometimes. The most valuable things in life don't come easy. I just think that uh, it's a great record waiting to happen right now. You know, I mean, I can feel it. So the signature Mike Ness sound, 67 Fender Bassman modded by Fred DeCone and divided by 13. And on top, 50 watts. That's all you need. Through two reissue Marshall cabinets, I don't think I've had to replace those speakers in 20 years because I'm only pushing 50 watts through eight speakers. So uh, they breathe. The, I kind of got a little bit of a surround of sound going, but it's got body because it's a big cabinet. And uh, number one, Les Paul. I would like to be remembered as someone who contributed and someone who helped shape things and change things, brought some authenticity, you know, kept that part of rock and roll. It's just got everything I need. You plug in, the thing practically plays itself.